two types of random in game design. Video games are full of randomness. There are roguelikes with procedurally generated level layouts, mm -hmm. role-playing games with random encounters, strategy games with unlucky misses, and games that play with cards, dice, roulette wheels, and random number generators, yeah. or RNG. It's all the same stuff, really. Situations and systems where the outcome is not fully determined by the developer or the player, but driven by the unpredictable whims of Lady Luck. But while randomness is responsible for some truly wonderful moments in gaming, it can also be a cruel mistress that oh, leads yeah. to unfair outcomes and frustrating failures. So like, in general, I've heard this argument a lot of times, like randomness in games equals fun, or like high randomness equals fun, low randomness to almost like no randomness equals like high skill and like no fun or whatever. Um, yeah, that's like in general, I've heard this argument a bunch of times, but it doesn't have to be like that, uh, you know, but let's just keep listening. RN Jesus, who is the personification of luck in the gaming community, is cursed just as often as he's worshipped. <laughs> so what gives? Why does this single game design tool lead to such radically different reactions? Do we just like luck when it lands in our favor and hate it when we lose? Yes. No, I don't think so. The truth is, some game designers actually split randomness into two distinctly different concepts, and recognizing these differences can be the secret to wrangling RNG and making luck more fun than frustrating. Right. I'm Mark Brown, you're watching Game Maker's Toolkit, and this is the two types of random. I'm intrigued. Before we get to that though, I think we need to talk about why randomness is used in game design. It's, it's for fun. Randomness, it, not gonna lie, it's just fun. You know, when, if you're playing like, like a roguelike or something like Hades or Crab Champions or something like that, um, it feels really good to just, hit like the jackpot and hit like a a baller set of mods in the beginning or whatever and just cruise you know because you're doing a shitload of damage really early and you just like lucked out all right it feels really good likewise on the polar opposite side um if you just get a uh, dog shit luck and you're not popping off with the the mods the little equips or whatever then it feels like actual dog shit when you're playing like all these roguelikes or whatever at all for starters randomness is used to provide variety well-made algorithms can pump out practically infinite setups levels mm -hmm. characters and problems sure a procedurally generated level is almost never as good as a completely handcrafted one but the clear advantage is diversity and quantity. Yeah. You couldn't make a game like Shadow of Mordor with its unique cast of orc captains, or Minecraft with its infinitely large worlds. With oh yeah, I forgot Lord of the Rings had like, what was it? They had RNG like orc, like RNG main characters that were bad guys or whatever. Like if you play through and you die a couple times or, or too many times, I forgot how that game went. I never played it. I wanted to though. I, I should one of these days. But like the bad, like if you play a, like one playthrough, there's gonna be like a set, like amount of bad guys or whatever, or captains or, or the ranks or whatever. Um, but if you play through again, they're not gonna be the same bad guys from your first playthrough. It's gonna be just a different named set of of bad guys, bad orcs. Without a big dollop of randomness, some games generate content once and then distribute that to all players. That's how every No Man's Sky player gets to explore the same set of, uh, 18 quintillion planets. <laughs> Other games generate new content. Ah, uh, was it No Man's Sky cannot catch a break? Isn't No Man's Sky supposed to be playable in, like, the modern day? It's supposed to be drastically different than when it first came out. It's supposed to be good now. Jeez. Every time you play, which is how games in the roguelike genre work. 
That can be beneficial because by removing the ability to endlessly replay the same level and memorize every aspect of the stage, players are forced to master the underlying mechanics of the game itself, so right. they're ready for absolutely anything the algorithm might throw at them. Randomness is also a way to balance a multiplayer game. Oh boy, he had to go to the FPSs and use Fortnite as, an, as the example. Oh my goodness. Okay, so if you're an FPS bro and you play some shooter, you have probably played a shooter where the gun or the, like the developer or whatever uh, chose to include some guns that have bloom in them. So what's bloom? So if you look at the reticle, uh, this reticle is not going to be static. You know, if if you go into like sprint mode, like I haven't played Fortnite or whatever, but let's just say like if you start to sprint or like in CS or Val or something uh, and you like run really fast or whatever, this reticle is going to open up like huge. So if you try to take a shot while you're moving, the, the bullet is going to randomly go somewhere not intended, you know? You want it to like be right on that little dot or whatever, but there's other mechanics in the game where, you know, you can aim down sight, uh, tighten the reticle, you can crouch to tighten the reticle, so on and so forth. Maybe, maybe this gun, I mean, I saw a little bit earlier, it was like every shot, uh, the dude was pulling, uh, the reticle was like getting wider and then it was snapping back. So, uh, the more shots you pull off, like consecutively over the course of time, the reticle just gets bigger and bigger forcing you to move in closer to your enemy or maybe there's guns where you can like you can like one tap like from far away and the reticle just snaps back or whatever um in my opinion i hate bloom bloom uh is not fun for me i mean some people might like it you know it's here or there or whatever but that's just a personal thing you know Basically, lucky rolls and unlucky draws can limit the importance of pure skill and give newer players a chance to get ahead. Oh, I think these both these thing dudes are bots. That's especially true when the randomness is weighted in favor oh. of new players, such as in Mario. Oh yeah, Mario Kart. I remember this. Oh man, I haven't played Mario Kart forever. So like in Mario Kart, you run across like the little uh, like random cubes or whatever. And like the further you are, okay, so I guess they're going like like this way or whatever. Like this is first place and this is like almost last place or whatever. Or maybe did this did Toad get lapped? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Maybe Toad got lapped. Whatever. So like in Mario Kart, the further like place you are, the better your power up is. Because that's the game. It's just a game mechanic that Mario Kart has. Like, they want the racers to always feel clumped up, and there's never, like, first place is going to get, like, the worst power ups. 11th or 12th place is going to get the best power ups because they want that constant tension between all the racers. Um, they, they don't want, like, first place to get so far out in front where it's just, like, you know, the first place dudes win by a landslide or whatever. That's why they have things in there like like bullet bill or the blue shell or, or whatever Mario Kart, where the random item boxes are way more generous to the players at the back of the pack than those in first place yeah this is usually only desirable when it's expected Ooh. that players of vastly different skill levels will be playing together otherwise the randomness can obscure who is actually the most skilled combatant so that's why it appears more often in party games and board games for families and not eSport level stuff. Yeah. Randomness can also be... Yeah, I think randomness in like party games and board games, I think that's completely fine because when you're playing those types of games, you're just chilling and you want to have some bullshit fun, all right? And then you can like brag later that it's like, oh, I'm better at Monopoly because I just fucking landed on the right spaces and you suck ass at the game. You're a shitty realtor. You know, it's, it's just fun used to make rewards in games more exciting. Grabbing an awesome new weapon from a dead body in a looter shooter like Borderlands is way more exciting when you know there was only a small chance for that gun to drop. Oh, this yeah. can, of course, be taken to the extreme, creating a Skinner box trick that's designed to sap your time or, more perniciously, your wallet. Oh, uh, yeah, the randomness in loot boxes where the devs aren't, uh, what's it called, legally obligated to disclose 
the drop rates of all their items. Like, thank God I did not play Call of Duty back in this day. Like, what the hell were they thinking when they implemented this, like, this monetization scheme with loot boxes? Like, uh, oh my God. And finally, randomness can play a role in the player's formation of plans, which are strategies that take a number of steps to achieve. Mm -hmm. Making plans requires information, which is essentially the current state of the game's variables, like the enemy's location, health, and perhaps even their intention for what they'll do next turn. The more information we have, the better our plans can be. But too much information can actually be quite troublesome. Ooh. For one, complete transparency can lead to players being able to calculate many possible moves into the future to figure out the optimum choice, right. a paralysis of analysis which can be super tedious, but you already know how players can optimize the fun out of a game. Oh yeah, and it's not like this is like a new thing. This is, this is a trend that's been happening for multiples of years, multiple tens of years now. Um, they will optimize the the, the quote unquote fun out of a game, uh, you know, it's, and it, that's honestly, that's only like, I think the people that actually do that, that optimize the shit, the fun out of the game, it's only like the top one tenth of 1% of the player base that actually does that at like, there's another chunk of people. I would probably be lumped in here that, you know, if I play a game and I get stuck or something, I'm just like, ah, oh, let me look up at a guide or something to fucking fix this bullshit. Cause I'm fucking too retarded to figure this shit out on my own. Like that's completely fine or whatever to like, to like look up guides or bills or whatever. Like you're not hurting anybody in my own opinion, but you got to understand that like when you do that, you kind of take the whole creative, creative process. Like you take the shit out of the creative process. And when you let like, some, like you look up a guide and like a build is different. It feels different when you make it through like your own understanding of the game versus you look up a guide and you look at somebody else's build that they already crunched the numbers, did this and that. These are the best items. These are the best stats and so on and so forth. It just, it's a, it, it feels different. This can already happen on a single turn of Into the Breach, which is a tactics game that shows you the entire board and every enemy's plan for their upcoming turn. You can spend 10, 20 minutes just staring at a static screen, figuring out the ramifications of every choice you might make. Plus, we can create airtight plans which rarely fail, like in Plants vs Zombies where we get to see oh. the exact cast of upcoming monsters and can quite easily create the perfect defense. This. I remember PVZ. PVZ was so good. Can create flat and uneventful gameplay as it's often much better when plans get disrupted with surprising new information. Bro, this is XCOM. This is like the, the meme of like, <laughs> like, like you, the player versus like, and you're standing right next to an alien. It's like 99% chance to hit or crit or whatever. The dude takes a shot and it's just like, miss. And then, and then the alien goes and then he just like, Wops you in the face. <laughs> that feels like dog shit. Forcing us to react, regroup, and replan. There's never been a good movie where the heroes come up with a scheme and it just perfectly works as intended. Right. Drama is driven by the unexpected. So we generally want to cap the amount of information the player has access to. The game designer Keith Bagun calls this the information horizon, defined as the distance between the current turn and the point at which information becomes known to a player. And there are four main ways to do this. Exponential complexity, like the ever-expanding matrix of game states in chess. Oh. Execution uncertainty, which comes from the player's unpredictable ability to carry out skill-based challenges. Yeah, that's another big one. Uh, the randomness of the player trying to execute a skill. That's a, that's a big one. Hidden information, Ooh. like the fog of war that hides the enemy's plans in StarCraft. And the one we're talking about today, randomness. Like not knowing what the enemies will do on the next turn in Into the Breach. You can't make perfect plans if- Well, here's the thing. On their next turn, they're gonna die. All right, so they don't get a next turn. It's easy. Just get good. Certain factors are by design, completely unpredictable. So, randomness certainly has a role in game design. 
But to really get to grips with it, we need to break it down into two types, which game designers frequently refer to as input randomness and output randomness. Ooh. Input randomness is when a random event occurs before the player gets to make a decision. The most obvious take on this is the procedurally generated levels in a roguelike, because they're cobbled together and then you get to play in them. Right. Other examples are drawing a hand of cards before taking your turn in a deck builder, or rolling dice and then choosing where to spend them in dicey dungeons. Here's another example of like input randomness. Like, and this, I think this is a great memory that I have. It was playing like Skyrim or whatever um, when it first came out on the 360. Like, I'm just like going to like some mission or whatever. And then I'm cruising through the woods on the horsey and through some random set of events, like I just come across like random mages uh, just fighting like the wildlife. And it was it like in it was night in the game and it was raining. And all I see in front of my screen is just like like elements like just getting like tossed around like chain like chain lightning, random fireballs going off uh, uh, and a bunch of other shit or it was happening. I think it, there was like some vampire bullshit, too. And uh, I thought that was like the coolest thing that I just ran into these NPCs just fighting each other like I and I'm 33 you know I remember that shit when Skyrim first came out and it's still stuck like sticks with me so like like input randomness is like can be really good all right but let's just keep uh listening output randomness though is when you make a decision and then luck takes over and the game tells you what happened the most infamous example of this is hit chances in XCOM, where yeah. you tell your soldier to shoot an alien, but it's down to chance whether your bullets will actually hit their target. Oh, man. Other examples are not knowing what the enemy will do until after you press end turn, or I guess paying for a loot box and only afterwards being told what was uh, in it. Well, it's Apex in general. Like You open a loot box and there's going to be nothing in there. Like, come on. You're going to do that 499 times and on the 500th time yeah you're gonna get a, an heirloom okay there's nothing random about this i've heard the same concepts be called pre-luck and post-luck by what? civilization 4 designer soren johnson all but right let's stick to input and output for this video these two terms were first introduced as far as i can tell on the podcast ludology Ooh. in general i find this distinction between input and output randomness to be very valuable I think that this is the fundamental difference between randomness that supports strategy and randomness that undercuts strategy. The host, Jeff Engelstein, makes a good point there. Output randomness is certainly more responsible for anger and resentment than input randomness. <laughs> output can take away control and break your plans, not out of strategic incompetence, but yeah. sheer bad luck. And most of the random stuff we like the least in games can be labeled as output randomness, such as random encounters and loot boxes. So certain developers are becoming privy to this. After FDL, which was stuffed to bursting with swingy output randomness, subset made Into the Breach, which almost exclusively Ooh. features input randomness, leading to a much fairer and more strategic game. And while early builds of Slay the Spire hid what the enemies were planning to do until after you finished your turn, the devs found the game was way more fun when they switched things around so the random choice happened at the start of your turn, allowing you oh. to strategize around your foes. Output became input. But I don't think it's just a case of input randomness equals good, output randomness equals bad. Nah. They're both tools that must be used wisely and poorly designed input randomness can wreck a game, just like carefully tuned output randomness can sometimes improve it. <laughs> With input randomness, these unpredictable starting conditions can sometimes massively dictate the likelihood of success. So in Spelunky, these crates have random items in them. You're much more likely to get something mediocre like bombs or ropes than something amazing like a shotgun or jetpack. But if you are so lucky as to get one of these items at the start of the game, you're going to have a much easier time of things. Dang. This can make it hard to tell if your success was down to skill or just good luck. And it can also make runs where you don't get the goodies 
feel slightly pointless. Some speedrunners will just restart the game over and over again until luck is in their favor and they get good items in an early crate or shop. Dang. To be fair. Bro, it sucks to be a Spelunky speedrunner, dude. <laughs> just by listening to that, your whole thing is based off of like the randomness of the crates. Oh my God. I mean, I guess that's what makes it more, uh, I don't know, prestigious maybe. I mean, cause even then it's like, I mean, cause there, that exists sometimes even in Kovacs, like you hitting a score, like a high enough score because the dots like spawned really close together. Or if you're doing like a bounce 180 type thing where, uh, the spawn points on the dots in the arcs that they, they choose to go in are just like so consistent that it's like, as long as you're good enough, you, you just got to hit it and you don't have to like do like a long flick to the left or the right or whatever. Um, th there's some like a little bit of that in like a, such a consistent skill based game, such as like Kovacs or aim lab or whatever. Um, but does it make it more like, I don't know, valuable slash prestigious or like exciting just because you hit like the, the random number generator jackpot and it's like, Oh my God. You know, just le like likewise on Spelunky, if uh, you hit like a good a good ass crate and you get like a shotgun or whatever, I never played Spelunky, and you just can like cruise through the the rest of the speed run. Like, is it because it did was the speed run good because he just hit like a random thing, and he was good enough to capitalize off it, or is it just like oh he's just lucky, and the, the, he I don't know that's a good question fair, this does lend Spelunky an interestingly spiky texture, but designers have found some clever new ways to present random starting conditions. In Slay the Spire, the devs didn't want you to just hit restart until you got some really powerful cards or a relic at the beginning of your run. So they introduced a system where you start the game with additional bonuses, but only if you made it to the first boss on your previous go. This encourages players to at least try to play with the stuff they're given, and oh. who knows, maybe they'll still find a strategy that can see them be victorious. Another way is to control the randomness in some fashion to reduce the chaos that it can bring. When setting up the tabletop game Pandemic, you start by removing all of the Epidemic cards from the play deck. These cards oh. are terrifying, game-changing events that can completely demolish your team. You then split the remaining cards into four piles and shuffle one epidemic card into each. Finally, you stack the four piles together to create a finished deck. It's a bit of a faff, but it's a clever way of ensuring that you always have a pretty fair game where epidemic events happen evenly throughout the adventure. Mm. It's impossible to have, say, three epidemics at the very start, or no epidemics until long after you've cured all the diseases but there's still a chance of getting two epidemics in a row or having an epidemic on the very first turn, though neither of these would break the game and the odds are slim enough for those to be exciting, surprising, one-off events. I've never said the word epidemic so many times. <laughs> and actually, lots of games put limits on their randomness. Oh, Diablo yes. 3 has a smart loot system where you're more likely to find items that match the character class you're playing to reduce the likelihood of finding pointless hats and swords. And in modern versions of Tetris, the game doesn't just pick a block oh at random God. for every drop. Instead, the game generates a random sequence of all seven blocks and then delivers them in that order oh. before making a new sequence. This in Oh, dang. Well, th this, this is a really good example for, what was it, input-output? Or how input randomness can fail? Like... This is like Battle Royale for Tetris, essentially. Um, hmm. This is, I never thought about it like this. Like, all the randomness for Tetris and how the pieces are randomly generated or, or whatever. Dang. Like, all these guys, like, did this guy just fail or whatever? Did he just get fucked on, like, the pieces or whatever? Or, or is he just bad at Tetris? You know, same thing with these guys. These guys seem, are seemingly getting fucked. Was it because of, of skill or was it because they just got uh, fucked on the, the pieces or whatever? 
ensures that you'll always get a diverse selection of blocks and there's an absolute maximum of 12 garbage blocks between two gorgeous eye blocks, <laughs> sometimes called line pieces or Colin Blocksworth. Yeah. And for what it's worth, while Spelunky typically has a low chance of randomly giving you one of these icky dark levels, the game won't spawn one if you finished the previous stage in under 20 seconds, just to be merciful to speedrunners. Another thing to consider Damn. is how often are new input randomness events occurring? If these occur at the start of every single turn, it can have the effect of drawing the information horizon in claustrophobically close and stopping you from making plans that last any time at all. Designers should ideally consider their game's information flow, a term <coughs> invented by Ethan Hopener in the article Plan Disruption. He points to XCOM, where we can make strategic plans about how we want to approach each mission, and for a good few turns, our plan will be pretty viable. Not perfect, thanks to all the output randomness, but close enough. But every now and again, you'll stumble onto a new pod of enemies, or a fresh batch of foes will descend onto the battlefield. This unexpected spike in new information disrupts your plan and forces you to stop, regroup, and rethink. He says a good pattern to follow is the spiky information flow, in which high-impact information is collected into discrete spikes that happen at regular intervals, huh. with a slow, regular flow of information between the spikes. As for output randomness, you might wonder why developers would want to use it at all. Well, for starters, this sort of randomness can be a good way of simulating mistakes and inaccuracies in a game with an abstract combat system, which is games where you tell characters to perform an action <laughs> rather than doing the action yourself. If your units never missed, then that wouldn't be particularly realistic. Also, output randomness forces players to think about risk management and to create contingency plans if things go wrong, which I think are totally valid skills to test. There's this idea that output randomness essentially becomes input randomness for the next turn because you'll be dealing with the consequences of whatever just happened. Uh, essentially, the best XCOM players are those who have a backup plan if their shots miss. And there are also methods to make output randomness feel more fun. One way is to get away from binary hit or miss mechanics. In Phoenix Point, which comes from original XCOM designer Julian Gollop, each bullet fired is simulated through a ballistic system, so you might find that uh -huh. some of your bullets hit and some of them miss, which is way less annoying than XCOM's punitive complete miss. It can also be important to show the player the odds, because huh. this allows them to make way more informed decisions about which risks they're willing to take, or how their actions, like moving closer to the enemy, can impact their chances of success. Unfortunately though, humans are just really bad at understanding odds. Five shots at 84%. Okay, so five shots at 84% hit chance, five misses. Explain that. Dang, dude. Bro, that's some dog shit luck. That's thanks to countless cognitive bi Missing 70% chance shots nonstop. Dang, seriously, every single unit I have is missing 78% chance shots. It's not even funny. I had a sniper miss 70% of the time. Uh, with shot chances of 78%, it seems like the RNG is if you want to kill, if you want to hit 70% of the time, you have to be shooting under 30% chance. <laughs> oh man, bro, this is like one of the main reasons I never got into XCOM because I would see this type of shit all the time. And yeah, there's probably an audience that it likes this style of game, but I, I am just not in that target audience. <laughs> biases in our pattern-seeking brains that make it really hard to deal with random numbers. In fact, game developers frequently lie about the actual chances of things happening. Oh so yeah. The probability in games better matches the broken probability in our heads. The numbers in most Fire Emblem games are subtly massaged in the player's favor. So, for example, a 90% chance to hit is actually more like a 99% chance. If you lose two th Bro, this is like what happens with like DMs or whatever in like Dungeons and Dragons. Like if there's a big bad, like bad end game boss or whatever, or just any uh, like big bad guy boss, it's like the the DM will sometimes not even give a shit about tracking like how much damage is done or how much health the the boss is at or whatever. And it's just like uh, as long as like 
there was like three plus turns as long as like three plus turns went by and like nobody went down or whatever and you guys were like hitting like uh hitting your shots or whatever or doing your damage wasting all your like dailies and and whatever and yeah you probably killed him <laughs> and this you know and it's not like the players know or whatever but like to some degree it feels good and then another to, to another degree it feels bad 33% chance battles in civilization, the third will always succeed because that's how we think numbers work. And there's allegedly a pity timer in Hearthstone to ensure oh, yeah. you'll always get a legendary card after a certain number of empty packs. If number manipulation isn't your- Oh yeah, there's a pity timer in Hearthstone. Um, there's a pity timer in Apex for getting like heirloom shards or whatever. Um, it's just a random number. Well, not a random number, but like a number that the developer feels is high enough to do that whole thing in life where it's like, oh, you bought 10 doodads. We'll give you one free or whatever, you know, for like if, you, if there's like a pizza place around you, it's like buy 10 pizzas, get one free, you know, for heirloom shards. It's like spend five hundred dollars, finally get the heirloom, you know. Um, for Hearthstone, it's, it's it's different. I haven't played Hearthstone in years or whatever, but it's probably along the same line. Spend like, I don't know, 50 to like 100 bucks. And it's like, yeah, you'll probably get a couple legendaries in there. The thing, one of the best ways to get around this is to ditch those cold, unknowable computer calculations in favor of recognizable real-world mechanisms like a six-sided die. Zach Gage, creator of the dice-filled space survival game Tharsis, says, We understand things that we can hold in our hand. When things get abstract, especially mm -hmm. with math, it becomes very difficult. Yeah. Human beings just have this innate understanding of stuff that we can touch and hold and turn and look at. The dice in Tharsis are an analog for something everyone is familiar with. Tharsis and the similarly tabletop-inspired Armello even include physics systems to drive their digital dice in an effort to make them seem even more realistic. Other games use cards, another familiar, real-world favorite. Cards oh, yeah. are interesting because where dice feature independent probability, i.e. each throw of the die has zero impact on the next one, cards mm -hmm. can have dependent probability, i.e. by drawing a card and removing it from the deck, you've now changed the makeup of the deck and impacted the probability of the next draw. It's the latter that makes it possible to rack up ridiculously fun synergies in Slay the Spire. It can also be good to have output randomness in places that will only ever be in the player's favor. The only real example of output randomness in Into the Breach is the game's building defense system, where there's a very small chance mm -hmm. that the enemy's attack will actually miss and save you from surefire defeat. The buildings can it's resist. It's so small that you never actually count on it to save you, but boy does it feel good when it lands. Oh my Here's the god. the game's co-designer, Justin Ma. We found that if there's randomness where you're expecting something bad and then you get something good, no one ever, ever complains. So that's the only type of randomness, output randomness that we left in the game. Oh, dang. So, randomness can be an incredibly important part of games. It's used for variety, balance, rewards, the information horizon, and probably more things I've forgotten about. But because it can impact everything from fairness to player psychology, it's something that designers must use with great care and attention. Understanding the difference between input and output randomness is perhaps the most important thing to learn. But it's also crucial to realize that neither of these is a silver bullet or a dastardly trap both can endanger yeah. or improve a game's design depending on how they are used. But when used correctly, randomness can do amazing things. It can create surprises and unique situations. It can force the constant re-evaluation of strategies, and it can turn players into risk-calculating tacticians. Dang. Thanks so much for watching. I've put some links in the description to some resources if you want to learn more about the technical side of random number generation, and also to head off the comments about how computers can't do true randomness. I also want to give a huge thank you to my patrons, especially those who helped contribute towards this video in my new GMTK workshop. 
It's a thing for $5 backers where they get to see early versions of certain new videos and provide feedback or suggestions. Their help was invaluable on this episode. Nice. I, I love this video. This was awesome. Showing you the difference between like the input output ram randomness or whatever. I thought this was great. Um, I just thought there was just one type of randomness or whatever. But you know, I play a different, like a couple different types of games or whatever. And, but, huh. Having uh, it divided up like that, I think it was really cool. Um, to try to, you know, figure out what's good type of randomness or bad type of randomness or whatever. Um, yeah, this is a great video. Uh, another banger from GMTK. Uh, yeah. So, uh, just give it a thumbs up or whatever. And, uh, that's about it. All right. Take it easy, guys. See you on the next one.